a uh, prophetic message. I know every message is given by God, but this this is different. Uh, give you a little backdrop before I read my text. Um, I forget what day this week it was. Sister Pam had sent a message or a link on the church feed about a message she had watched. And my wife and I were at work, but we were heading to Lowe's to pick up some material. So we decided to listen to it. We got maybe about four minutes into the, into the, it was, I think at the beginning it was a prophecy and then there was a message later. We got about four minutes into it and it began to bear witness with our spirit. And so as the, as the message began to, she began to preach the message, the woman's preaching, they begin to preach the message. I said to the Lord, I said, God, I said, I want you to confirm this to me. And he did immediately. The Lord spoke something to me, told me to go to a certain place in the Bible and read. And what the woman was talking about on the video was in the text that he told me to read. And uh, so it's pretty powerful. So, so I had all those aha moments. It's like, okay, Lord, you're, you're, you're trying to tell me something here. And he said, I want you to continue reading to the end of the chapter. And so I got down to, uh, if you would uh, stand with me, Genesis chapter 35. And I'm going to be I'm going to be preaching from between Genesis chapter 31 and Genesis chapter 37. There's a there's a, it, it 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 may not take you long to read it, but there's a lot of years in between those chapters. A lot of years, a lot of stuff, a lot of crazy stuff going on there. A lot of good stuff too, but um, but our text is going to be Genesis chapter 35, and I'll explain more about what my title is at, as we get to the um, end of the text. Genesis chapter 35 and beginning at verse 27. Jacob came to Isaac, his father, at Mamre of Kirath Arab, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had lived temporarily. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Isaac's spirit departed and he died and was gathered to his people who had preceded him in death. An old man full of days, satisfied, fulfilled. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him in the cave of Mac Machpelah with his parents, Abraham and Sarah. When I got to the point right there, now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Now, like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to Genesis, I believe it is 31, and all the way up to Genesis chapter 37, we're going to kind of hit some points through there. But when the days of Isaac were 180 years, the Lord spoke to me. He said, stop right there. He said, what is 180? I said, a turnaround. He said, yes, a turnaround. Now, that was, the, that was his age, 180 years old, which is pretty old. But what it represented, because... If you, if you go to Genesis chapter 36, it talks about Esau's family. That entire chapter is dedicated to Esau's offspring and all his kinfolk. You go to chapter 37, the very second verse talks about Joseph. Now, everything changed when Joseph came on the scene. Because that's when they went into Egypt. All the stuff that happened to Joseph in Egypt. It is, it is, let me tell you something. If if you knew about everything going on in my life right now, and I, when I say my life, I mean my wife and I in our ministry and all the stuff that's going on in our life right now, you you would understand that this this right here is is powerful, especially just for us personally, my wife and I personally. It's very, very powerful. But yet I want to share this with you because this pertains to your life too as well. But I want to preach this, the 180 degree manifest. 
the 180 degree manifest. There are things right now in the spirit that are turning. There are things that are turning. There, there, you you got to be careful of some Christians because right now they have this idea that, that everything is just headed toward doom and gloom and, and we're just all just going to, you know, we're going to be sitting around in the dark trying to, trying to light candles and, and eating grass. That's how some Christians would like for you to think is going to happen. But I'm telling you, it's not. It's not going to happen. Number one, there's a wealth transfer coming. That's biblical. That's not me being a money preacher. That's me being biblical. There's a wealth transfer coming. Where the, the wealth of the unjust is laid up for the just. Second of all, there's an exodus coming. And that's on a twofold. One, there's an exodus coming of God's people out of Egypt. That's spiritual. Because there's a lot of Christians right now that are cold. But God's going to wake them up. There's a lot of Christians who don't know their God. Is it, does it ever, did you ever think about this when Moses said to the Lord, when I go there and I tell them, who do I tell them? Sent me here. In other words, they don't know you. You tell them that I am that I am has sent you. It's, it's all kind of good stuff. It's all kind of good stuff. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. Thank you for your word. God, help me because I'm just flesh. I'm, I'm just a mouth of flesh. So God, I ask you today to help me to speak the oracle of God. Help me to speak what your mind conveyed to me, what you told me. Help me to preach it to them in a way that they can grasp it. Don't let me confuse it. Don't let me be misleading in any form or fashion. Not that I would on purpose. But God, help me to speak your word with power and with truth and with light. God, that they may see, hear, and know your will for your church in this day and hour that we live in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Sister Pam, thank you for this message today because if you hadn't said what you said, God never would have led me to where I'm at right now. So thank you. You know, I thought you wanted to say something. Every one of us know it's real easy for life to become unmanageable. I mean, if you, if you take care of your yard at the house, if you, if you care at all about your yard, you know how quick it can get out of hand. I mean, right now everything's starting to die up again, but you let a good rain come and grass starting to grow and it's just everywhere. You know, and you can ride by some people's house and you know that they're just too busy to get it cut at the moment. You ride by some other people's houses and you know they just don't care if the grass grows. They don't care how junky it looks. They don't care about nothing. That's how life gets sometimes. If life, if we get unconcerned about our life, it can get out of hand real quick. Or if we get distracted by things, it happens. Life becomes unmanageable. And they're just, these are just some of the things that lead us away from the things that tether us to stability. When we let things get out of hand, the job of bringing them back into order can be difficult and it can take a lot of time. And we know this, that life has enough twists and turns without us creating any more. Life has enough of its own drama without us trying to create drama. That's why we have to learn how to set boundaries in our lives. Boundaries are a good way to keep us operating at a safe pace. But when we push past the boundaries, life can quickly get out of control. So instead of managing your life, which way God wants you to, we end up wrestling all of it. In Genesis chapter 31 and 32, it begins to tell us the story of Jacob when he is living with his uncle Laban. Now, there's something about the nature of Jacob that we have to understand is in each one of us. And the Bible contrasts that nature between Jacob and, and later he becomes Israel. And we look at the life of Jacob that when he's living with his uncle, Jacob's life has become unmanageable. He's got drama at the house. He's got one wife that he really doesn't care nothing about, but yet he can't seem to stop having kids with her. 
He's got another wife that he says he loves, but yet she can't have children. He's got an uncle that's got his eye on him thinking he's being deceptive. There's all kind of drama that's taking place at the house. And Jacob's life is just in every which way going every which way. Because Jacob is doing something that we all have a tendency to do. Instead of putting things into God's hands, we have a tendency of trying to manipulate life the way that we want life to go. And we end up fighting our way to a better life instead of seeking the favor of God for our life. Right. Favor will get you so much more than fighting will. It's true. And here's the thing about God. Here's one of the interesting things about God. Of course, there are many, but here's one. God will meet you on your own terms. God will meet you on your own terms. If wrestling is what we want, he will wrestle us. When Jacob crosses the brook Jabek, after he leaves his uncle Laban and cheats him out of a bunch of stuff, sort of, kind of, it's kind of all messed up, he gets to the brook Jabek and the Bible said, and there wrestles a man with him. So if you want to wrestle with God, God will wrestle with you. He'll wrestle with you all night long. The Bible said they wrestled all night long. But with God, here's another thing you got to understand. Our terms will become a test much greater than we could ever imagine. When Jacob meets God, Jacob begins to wrestle with God. And they wrestled all night long. And God wrestled with him. God said, you know what? If this is what you want to do, we'll do this all night long. And they wrestled. But there finally come a point where God said, enough is enough. Something's got to change here. And the Bible said God smote him on the hip. And the sinner began to shrink. And there he was, one leg shorter than the other. God met him on his own terms. But it turned into a test greater than what Jacob was expecting. Jacob's fears met a foe at the Jabbok brook and that fear had to fight and the thing of it was it wasn't what Jacob was expecting he got all out of joint and all he could do was hold on because here's the thing you can't fight a move of God if God is wanting to do something in your life you cannot fight it you can try you can push you can struggle you can try to do this and you can try to manipulate God but at the end of the day when the thing is really getting down to the nitty gritty you've got to learn that if I'm going to do it God's way I've got to learn how to hold on and let God work. Amen. Let me tell you something. I've tried to fight God on many different levels and many different times. And I've learned something. He's going to have his way. I've got to learn how to hold on. That's what God said to Jacob. He said, let me go for the day breaking. And he said, oh no. He said, I will not let you go. We did things my way but now I'm going to do them your way I'm going to hold on to you until I get the miracle that I've been looking for and that is where we are right now we've got to trust God in this season that we're going through that God I've tried to do it my way we've tried to lean upon men which is the wrong direction God I'm going to hold on to you because God will cripple your way of life so he can change the course of your life Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. He will cripple the Jacob in you so that he can bring the Israel out of you. Jacob is a deceiver, but Israel was a prevailer. And God has destined you to prevail. His church has been destined to prevail. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We can't fake it till we make it anymore. We've got to be the Israel that God is destined for us to be and not the Jacob we want to be. I want to tell you that tendency in every one of us to be that Jacob is something that we've got to deal with from day to day and week to week. Because sometimes we want to get ahead of God. Sometimes we think God's not doing it quick enough. We think that, God, why am I going to hold on so long? So let me just do what I want to do over here and somehow manufacture what I need, but it can only come from you. We've got to be the prevailer. The limping, short-legged Israel is a whole lot more powerful than a wrestling Jacob. And that, to me, is more, because here's the thing. If I have to live with a cripple or a handicap in my life, but yet I know I've stepped through a door with God 
That is the most powerful change of my life. I will deal with a handicap. Because that means more to me than anything. Because sometimes God cripples you to give you a reminder that you're not leaning on your own understanding. But you're leaning on something supported by a greater strength than you and I could ever have on our own. God is the reason why we are making it, folks. It's not because of a presidency or a presidential run. It is the God of all glory, the King of all kings, is the reason why we are making it. And he has plans for your life greater than you and I can conceive. God wants to show us his face and not just the power of his hand. Because the hand that can heal you can just as quickly cripple you. That hand is powerful. But you know what his face brings? His face brings favor. And his favor brings change. He said, you will no longer be called, be called Jacob, but you shall be called Israel because you have prevailed with God. Hallelujah. In other words, he said, Jacob, you got a place here by me. You've got some status with me right here because you held on through the worst pain of your life, through the worst test of your life, through the worst trial of your life. You have held on. And because you have, I have, you, I have given you favor on your life. We have got to fix our eyes upon Jesus because God is about to turn some things around in your life because you have shown yourself faithful to God in the worst test of your life. Because here's the prophetic word from God, Genesis chapter 32, 31. And the Bible said, now the sun rose upon him as he began to walk away crippled. This is a sign from God that the night season you've been going through and the night season we've been holding on as a church is about to turn from sorrow into joy. God is about to shine the light of his victory over your life and turn things in your favor. Isn't it amazing what God has brought you through? Isn't it absolutely amazing the things that God has brought you through in your life? I look at the story of Jacob and Jacob's fight ended up in favor. His fears were turned into favor. And he leaves that place where he has wrestled with God at Jabbok. And the Bible said he travels to Sukkoth. Now Sukkoth means a booth or a temporary shelter. It was there the Bible said that Jacob built temporary shelters for all of his flocks. And they called the name of the place Sukkoth. Well, during the Feast of Tabernacles is when the Israelites will do what they call Sukkoth. They will build booths on their porches or on their decks or whatever they got over there. And they will live in those booths for seven days during the Feast of Tabernacles. That is a reminder to them that God brought them out of Egypt into the Promised Land. It was a reminder that God changed their course. They would celebrate it. To remind them that God had turned things around. He brought them 180 degrees. Now I'll explain that just a little more in a minute. Now here's something the Lord spoke to me. He said there are things that I'm doing right now in your life. That may not happen during your lifetime. But will affect the future of your family. I thought, man, that's exactly what God did with Jacob. God spoke to him and said, I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to make you a nation of nations. A king shall proceed unto you. So Jacob was living in Canaan at the time God spoke this to him. God sends Jacob to Egypt. Jacob would die in Egypt. He would never see his children have the promised land. But what he did secured the future for his family. So we go to chapter 35. And here's where I want to explain some things. We go to chapter 35, and God makes this, reiterates the promise to Jacob again. 
If you go to verse, if you go to chapter 37, it's all about the life of Esau. Well, we don't care about Esau, do we? No, not right now. Not, not during this message. We don't care about Esau. But sometimes you got to work through an Esau moment to get to a Joseph experience. So if you read it in order, we have Jacob at Bethel. God said, I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to have kings of kings. that are going to come out of your loins. So Jacob's still there, but Jacob ended up going down to Egypt. But here we got Esau. Nobody wants to read about Esau. We don't care about Esau, do we? But you got to go through an Esau moment to get to a Joseph. So Esau sits now, sits between now and an experience at Bethel, the house of God, where God tells Jacob, he said, I want you to go up to Bethel because there I'm going to manifest myself to you. You know what that means? God said, I want you to go to Jacob because I'm going to come down in physical form and we're going to talk. That's, that's pretty powerful. But as you're looking at Esau, you're like, wow, why do I, you know, we, we read those chapters in, what is it, Chronicles, where so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so. And you know, honestly, if you're honest, you probably have never read any, all of those in your entire life, have you? <laughs> I made it a point to read them one time. So I said, Lord, I've got to read this. But, when you're going through an Esau moment, the Esau moment wants to distract your attention off of what's to come. Because a lot of times when we get in an Esau moment, we get in a hurry to move on. Just like when you're reading all those so-and-so begat, so-and-so, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, and that seems like it's so boring and it seems like it has nothing to do with the Bible whatsoever about your future, but yet it does. It's important. It's the reason why it's there. And I'm not going to get into that. But you've got to go through the Esau moment. But that Esau moment is the test of your faith because you know something's coming, but yet here you are struggling with this. You've got questions and all. Like, why do I have to read about Esau? Why do I go, why do I have to go through there? Well, for one, the Bible put it there. And you've got to deal with it. Just some stuff in your life you've got to go through to prepare you for what's coming. So this is how God works. Before the turn, the 180 degree blessing, a miracle that God wants to do in your life, before that happens, God begins to turn us before that ever begins to happen. Look at Genesis chapter 35, verses 2 and 4. Then Jacob said to his household, to all that were with him, get rid of the idols and images of foreign gods that are among you and ceremonially purify yourselves and change into fresh clothes. Then let us get up and go to Bethel and I will make an altar there to, the, to, to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So the Bible said they, they gave Jacob all the idols and images of foreign gods, they, they, the rings and whatever charms they wore against evil things. And the Bible said Jacob buried them under the oak tree near Shechem. Before God ever spoke the blessing in Jacob's life, God began to turn their heart and mind back toward him. He said, I want you to get rid of all the idols and I want you to bury them. If we want to see the manifested presence of God, we have got to make a choice. Will it be our idols or will it be God? And let me tell you something. He, was saying, he may say, Brother Paul, that's got nothing to do with me. Yeah, it's got to do something with everybody because if we're not careful, there are things in this world that can become our idol. There are things in this world that can begin to take the place of God in our life. And it can happen very easily. And if we want to see the manifested presence of God, and I'm not just preaching this church, I'm preaching whoever's watching on YouTube. We have got to get back to the place where every bit of the idols that we have built up and every bit of the stuff that we brought into our life that we think God has approved of and he's not approved of, we got to get out of our life. we got to get it far from us and we've got to bury that and say leave it there. We're never going back for it again because we want the presence of God. 
And here's the thing. The Bible said they purged themselves. They purified themselves. They not only got rid of their idols. The Bible said they changed their garments. That is, they went through a purification process. And as they went through a purification process, the Bible says as they begin to go up toward Bethel, God put the fear of the entire land on them. In other words, everybody else around them were afraid to touch them because they had consecrated and purged themselves before God. So they purged themselves and the purging brought a hedge of protection around Jacob and his family. I think that is so powerful because it is supernatural protection as they made their way to where God was going to manifest himself to his family. I want to tell you something. If we want that same protection, if we want that same favor, if we want that same move of God in our life, we have got to purge ourselves of everything that is not of God. I want this church to see the glory of God. And if purging is the price for his presence, then God purge us. Show us, God, where everything in our life has got to become second place and you've got to become first. Because yes. I want to show you something that happens. Every time a purging happens, something dies. Genesis chapter 35, verse 8. Now Deborah, who once was Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried below Bethel under the oak in the name of what was called Alam Bakuth, or Oak of Weeping. Every time there's a purging, a death happens. Now notice, it wasn't until the purging and it wasn't until the death that God reiterates to Jacob I want to remind you again of who you are. You are Israel. Mm, I want to tell you something. My pen cannot move quick enough. God is going to remove the doubt out of our minds as to who we are in him. These doubts have held some of you back from stepping into the call that God has on your life. But God's removing that doubt out of your mind to let you know this isn't a fluke. This wasn't just some good experience you had at church and now you got to go through a lot of trouble. No, God is saying, let me tell you, let me show you something, Jacob. He said, this is to let you know you are who I say you are, that you are in Israel, that you are a prevailer. The turnaround was happening. That Jacob was dead and the Israel was alive. Look at this. Go with me. Uh, Genesis 35, verse 16 through 18. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when they were still some distance, when they were still some distance to go to Bethlehem. Rachel began to give birth and had difficulty and suffered severely. When she was in hard labor, the midwife said to her, Do not be afraid, you shall now have another son. And as her soul was departing for she died, she called him Benoni, which means son of my sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, son of my right hand, or son of power. Here's part of the 180 degree manifest. God is birthing things into your life. And the enemy will love nothing more than to destroy the prophetic future of your destiny and the prophetic future of your blessing. The enemy would love nothing more than to come into your life and say, look, you're going through this, you're going through that. God doesn't care. Life is over. This is never going to change. We're going to call this thing Benoni, which means son of sorrow. But God has decreed a Benjamin on your life, which is son of power. God said, I've got other plans than what you may be seeing right now in front of you. Because I want to tell you something. You think about how helpless that little baby was laying there, not knowing that what his mother said about him was going to turn his life into nothing but pain and hell. But I thank God that he has other plans. When life says this is the way it's going to go and you can't change it, there is a God of power who's going to step in and say, no, 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 I've got plans for this church. I've got plans for your life. Despite what you've been through and despite the pain you've suffered, I have a decree over your life that I'm going to turn things around 
and you're going to become a son of power. You're going to become a daughter of power. Yes. God has the power to turn anything around. Nothing is permanent when it comes to God's will and desire to change it. See, the thing is, God's moving us toward a moment of change and nothing can stop it. The 180 degree manifest is speaking into your life of great and powerful change. You've got to decree that manifest over your life. You've got to get up every day and say, God, my change is about to happen. God, you are raising up sons and daughters of power to bring prophetic change into this world. And I am a part of that prophetic change. I am a part of this end time move of God that is coming. Yeah. You've got to decree it. You're, you're not just on the earth just because it's a good idea. God thought, well, it's just a good idea to have you here right now. No, you're here because you've got something to do. The 180 degree manifest is a declaration of change. So now we come to chapter 37. Joseph comes into play. Now, Joseph will be the catalyst that causes the word of promise spoken to Jacob to come to pass. Because at Bethel, God speaks to Jacob and he says, listen, I'm going to make you into a powerful nation, nation of nations. Kings will come out of your loins. This is going to happen. That's going to happen. So now here comes Joseph. Now, listen to what God said to him. He said it would be a building of a nation. The word nation can translate to many things in the Bible. It can translate to tribe, peoples. It can translate to congregation. And it can translate to church. And you know what church means? It means called out. Where he said, I will call my son out of Egypt. He's calling for his church. So he says to Jacob, he said, I'm going to make a church out of you. A peculiar people, chosen generation, tribe, church. Now in Acts chapter 7, Stephen preaches about a church. Specifically, verse 38, Stephen is preaching. And he said, this is that he that was with them, with the church in the wilderness. So he's speaking of Moses. Now Moses says to the people of Israel, he says, there is going to come a prophet like me. And then let me tell you something. This, this is just, I, had, I, I think I read chapter 7 about three different times. Acts chapter 7 about three different times. Because in that chapter, Stephen talks about Joseph. Talks about Moses, talks about Joseph. So, so he says, Stephen says in Acts chapter 7 verse 38, this is he that was with the church in the wilderness. Talking about Moses was with the church in the wilderness. Moses is a type of Christ. Most, most, most preachers will never say that, but it's the truth. Because Moses said, there's going to come a prophet just like me. And as Stephen says this, he says, and as he was in the church in the wilderness, talking with the angel of God, who is the angel of God in the Old Testament? Christ. Because who was, who was Moses referring to? The Christ. Who, how many knows what? Christ is Messiah Moses said there will come a Messiah or a prophet like me as I led you out of physical Egypt he will lead you out of spiritual Egypt he calls them a church I wish I wish you'd find the shut up button this is my watch but Stephen is standing there preaching to the high priest about Jesus. And he brings Moses into the mix and he says, look how God brought them out of Egypt into the promised land. Now Stephen mentions in Acts chapter 7 of Joseph being sent into Egypt. 
Now, like I said, this was the turning. This was the beginning of a turn to the prophetic fulfillment of what God had promised Jacob. It was a turn that would take over 400 years to happen. And here's the thing. Sometimes a turn this powerful takes time. But it was turning. You may be looking at your own life and say, what's taking so long? What's taken so long? But it was turning. It wasn't until Joseph went down into Egypt that the turn began to happen. Right after Isaac, no, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself. Just hold on, say, hold on, Pastor. Don't go too quick. The 180 degree manifest is speaking a powerful turn. And this is how much the enemy is scared of it. The pharaohs of this world are going to try to kill and attempt to abort the blessings that are being birthed right now in the church. There is something dynamic happening within the body of Christ. Now, I know something. You may say, well, I don't see it. I don't feel it. That don't matter. When they were in Egypt for 400 something years, you would have said up and down, there's no way God's turning this thing around. Look, every day was the same old day. But yet behind the scenes, God was working. See, that's where your faith comes in. Your faith comes in right now where you're looking and say, God, I don't see any change. I don't see anything happen, but that's all right. I believe it's happening. That's where your faith has got to step in. The pharaohs of the world want nothing to do but to abort everything that God is birthing in your life. How many of you can raise your hand and say, Pastor, I feel the birth pains in my life. I feel it. I feel like I've been carrying this thing for 12 months. We can feel the birth pains. We can feel the weight of the blessing that God is birthing in our life. And the enemy wants nothing more than to kill it. But let me tell you, God has a lively church. You know what the midwives said in Exodus chapter 119? They said, hold on a second. Our women ain't like your women. Our women, they said, are lively women. Our women are powerful women. And they can't, we can't get in there quick enough to abort the child because they've already had the baby before we can ever get in there. They're lively. That's the kind of church that God is birthing in this world. He is birthing a lively church where you are lively stones, he said. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you something. When God begins to build his church and God begins to turn his church, it is so powerful that it cannot be stopped because the spirit of the church is a prevailing spirit. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, you have power with God. For you have prevailed with God. That is the identity of God's church, his spiritual Israel. We are a prevailing people. And the devil wants nothing more than to stop it. But the Bible said the people multiplied and they grew very mighty. The promise to Jacob about nations and kings coming out of him was being manifested right in the worst opposition that Israel had ever been through. Because let me tell you something, when God begins to turn, nothing can stop it. This is where we are. Now listen, I want to I I throw some numbers out at you here. I'm almost finished. Just hang with me a few more minutes. Isaac dies at 180 years old. When Jacob and Esau were born, Isaac was 60. Jacob spent 31 years in Pan, Pan and Aram. 31 years. So at the age of 77, Jacob leaves home. He's gone for 31 years. So by the time Jacob returns back to Isaac, Isaac is 108 years old. Okay? Just hang with me here. Jacob was 120 years old when Isaac died. Isaac died around 12 to 13 years after Joseph was sold into slavery. Joseph was 17 when he was sold into slavery. He was 30 when he became prime minister. Right after Isaac died, Jacob became prime minister of Egypt. 
180. You can shout later. It was the beginning of a turn. At the time of Isaac's death, Joseph's life turned 180 degrees. In Psalms chapter 105, verses 16 to 27, he said, God said, he broke the whole staff of bread, the whole lamb of the famine, but he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold as a servant, whom they laid in fetters. And the Bible said he was tormented by the chains. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. Joseph had to wait. But after the word of God was revealed to him and the word came to pass, turn after turn after turn, God manifested his will and the power to break the power of Pharaoh and to bring his people into their promise. That is where God spoke to me and said, this is where my church is right now. We are in the beginnings of a turn. We are in the beginnings of a 180 degree turn. We have, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. God is about to turn things around like we have never seen before. The word manifest means to make evident by showing or displaying through signs or actions. When I said to the Lord, I said, God, what do you want me to preach? He said, I want you to preach the 180 degree manifest. I said, what does that mean? He said, study it. It means that God is turning things around by showing and displaying signs and wonders in our life. God is orchestrating a coming out of Egypt. Do you understand that God wants to break the influence and dependency of this world on our life? Do you understand how tied in we are? to the dependency of this world? Big time. Can you imagine having enough money that you don't have to worry about going to work for somebody and making a paycheck? I can imagine, I imagine every single day of my life. Can you imagine as a church not to worry about it, we don't have enough money to make the rent, but we got so much money that we can have programs and we can help people get out of debt. We can have programs to help people get out of addiction. We can help people, programs to get out of a battered marriage or a battered home and put lives back together again. Can you imagine if we have that kind of resources and we have that kind of money? Say, Brother Paul, that's, 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 that's just stuff you hear about that doesn't happen just every now and then to a lot of other people, not us. Let me tell you, that's not my mentality and that's not the way I believe it. Moses told the people of Israel after 400 something years, he said, I want you to go to the Egyptians and I want you to tell them what you want and they'll give it to you. And the Bible said they plundered the Egyptians. They took that money and they built the house of God in the wilderness. Amen. They took the money of Egypt and used it to build the house of God. Of God. They took the money and the gold out of Egypt and they used it to help build the church. Let me tell you, that's what God is going to do in this end time. We're not going to have to worry. Are we going to have the money to keep the lights on? God said, I'm going to give you the plunder of Egypt and they're going to help build the church. They're going to help facilitate an end time move of God that's going to help people heal and get their lives back together. And God is saying, you're my church. I'm going to use you. God is saying, you're my church. And I'm going to bring miracle signs and wonders into your life that are going to manifest themselves that you're going to know that you're coming out of things that have held you back and held you up and is bringing you into a transition that is going to carry you into the promises that I have spoken over your life. I'm telling you, God is ready to do a 180 degree blessing into your life. It's going to turn for your good. And it's going to supply you with the things that you need to live out the calling and the destiny that he has placed on your life. It's happening, church. Somebody say it's happening. We've been in transition, but we're going to travel. We're moving forward to our promise. God has been preparing us. This is something that I, my wife and I have been talking about now for weeks. My wife and I drink a lot of coffee. We drink a lot of, we talk a lot, drink a lot of coffee. 
God has been preparing us for a long time. God's been preparing this church for something for a very long time. Because destiny is greater than any one of us. It is greater than any one of us. But God is equipping us to live it out. Can you feel, can you, is there anybody in here that can feel in your spirit that something is different and that something is changing? I can't. I, I can't even I can't even put it into words sometimes what I feel in my spirit. I can't. If someone said, write it down and explain it to me, I couldn't explain it. It's just something I feel. It's just something I know. Is God working in your life right now in a way you've never seen him work before? Let him turn it around. Let him, let him take your life. Everything that he wants to do in it, just let him, just let him turn it to where it needs to be. Jacob was in Canaan. God said, I'm going to send you into Egypt. I want to bring you back to the promise. And this time, though, it's going to be different. Instead of being a stranger, you're going to own it. <laughs> Instead of just wandering around from place to place, you're going to own it. You're going to own it all. <laughs> That's a turnaround. That's a turnaround. And God wants to turn things around in your life, too, just like that. Because everybody knows what's been holding them up and everybody knows what's been keeping you from whatever it is that God's placed on your life. It's not, it's not, it's frustrating. It's, it's what it is. It's just frustrating dealing with things that you know. It's like, if, if I could just get this out of my way, God's going to turn it. Scripture says he has turned for me my morning into dancing. He has turned for me 180 degrees my morning into dancing. Are you ready for it? Do you believe God's called you for something great? Do you believe that as a church, God has called this church for something great in this last day? Yes, amen. I do too. Let's stand together and let's praise the Lord. Thank him today. Thank him for 180 degree turn in your life. Thank him for his blessings on your life. Thank him. That he's brought you out of that spiritual Egypt. He's bringing you into something more powerful than your mind and your spirit and your vision can even encapsulate. He's bringing something so mighty into your life and your heart that it's going to take God to get it done. Hallelujah. Thank him today. Praise him. Give